Are you ready to embark on an adventure through the world of words? Join us on The Reading Revolution and let's explore the exciting world of literacy together. Hello and welcome to The Reading Revolution powered by bookvending.com. I am your host, Josh Gregory. Today we are being joined by Julia Bruckle, Director of Program from Read to Succeed Buffalo. Read to Succeed started in 2007 right here in Western New York and is focused on improving the literacy in early childhood ages. Now that they are still going this many years later, they are now serving over 1,000 students in the Buffalo area, helping them in all facets of reading and learning from ages six weeks up until the ages of eight. Do I have that correct, Julia? Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. To get things going, can you talk a little bit about your background and how you came to be a part of Read to Succeed Buffalo before we talk about the nuts and bolts of what Read to Succeed is? Sure. Um, So my mom was a first grade teacher um, for many, many years. Um, She retired from Akron Central School um, after teaching there for 30 plus years um, in first grade. So I really understood um, the commitment that teaching and education was. Um, And then throughout um, my childhood, reading was always so important. My parents um, like to talk about this. Apparently this one time on the 4th of July, I was waiting for the fireworks with a flashlight and a book. Um, So, you know, the early days of um, a book light, right? Um, So reading has always been really important to me. Um, But somewhere in high school or college, with all of the mandated reading, um, reading for fun, reading for pleasure, um, just started dropping off for me. So it wasn't until after college, um, really picking up the Harry Potter series that I got back into reading for enjoyment, reading for pleasure. Um, and particularly now with, with book groups and, um, talking about books on social media and, um, so many great book lists available. I, I'm, I'm very much into um, reading and talking about a good book um, with my coworkers and with my friends. Um, so yeah, reading has always been very important. Obviously, that passion needs to be there in any walk of life in employment and even in hobbies. What brought you to Read to Succeed? I went for um, education um, in college, um, and just out of college, I was hired as a Head Start teacher. So I was working with three- and four-year-old students, um, the little ones, um, and really on all of those foundational skills um, while working on my master's in in literacy. Um, And really, at that time, um, I think that um, my classroom was my classroom, and my schoolwork was my schoolwork. And I kept them um, almost separate in my mind. Um, after working at Head Start for a number of years, um, I saw a position open um, for a literacy coach at Read to Succeed Buffalo. Um, at the time, Read to Succeed Buffalo had an early reading first grant. Um, and the literacy coaches were going into the Head Start classrooms to help provide embedded professional development or coaching in the classrooms. Um, And I thought it was such a wonderful opportunity with my Head Start experience. Um, And at at that stage in my life, that's where I really learned um, how to take the theory of what I had learned in college and really apply it to what um, the students should and could be learning in the classroom. And I really um, just loved being able to see that theory from practice, um, from theory to practice. So you started off right at the beginning stages of Read to Succeed. Yes. And it's a four-year grant for this EFR. Was there any vision already to say, even when this four-year grant is up, we want to continue with this? That had to take a lot more vision and a lot more planning to just make sure that this was going to exist as an organization that was going to continue to help kids. Correct. Um, I think at the time um, there was a change in leadership. Um, And rather than focus on kind of whole literacy, um, 
from beginning to end, um, we really narrowed our focus on where we could um, support best, um, which is increasing childhood literacy, as you said, really from infancy all the way through third grade. And if you're wondering why third grade, um, third grade, by the end of third grade, children really need to learn how to read. All those mechanics of um, phonics, of phonemic awareness, um, letters representing sounds, sounds um, forming words, um, all of those different skills and learning how to read so that after first after third grade, they can read to learn. All of those skills in fourth grade and above, they really need to be able to read to understand math and science and social studies concepts um, that they'll be taught in those upper elementary grades. So when we're talking about what you're doing on a day-to-day basis there, walk us through all the programs that are available for those who need it. So we have three programs currently. We have a care child care program where we have a literacy coach who goes into licensed home child cares and licensed child care centers and helps coach the teachers. Um, again, really bridging that theory into practice, um, but also providing that coaching. Um, we know even the best athletes in the world um, need a coach, need that um, encouragement, need that um, sometimes direction, um, but really an opportunity to pause and reflect um, what has gone well and what can be done um, to do even better in the second um, in the second half, if you will. We also have a care ch- uh, excuse me. We also have a care preschool program. Um, where we have a literacy coach that coaches um, Head Start or preschool teachers. Um, Again, that embedded professional development, that coaching. So the coach is in the classroom, um, in the classrooms every day, observing, um, really conducting fidelity observations. Are the teachers doing... um, what the most they can be doing to support the children in the progression of literacy skills. Um, they look at data and as assessment data and making sure that the data is being used um, effectively and efficiently. Um, again, there's that reflection time for the teachers to really pause and think, what have the students been doing? How can I help change their practice? Um, And then they provide professional development or training, um, bringing in new concepts or ideas, new theories, um, new strategies for them to apply in the classroom. Um, And then our third program is Experience Core. It is sponsored by AARP Foundation. Um, And you might be wondering, what does AARP Foundation have to do um, with literacy? But we support a core of volunteer tutors, age 50 or better, um, that come into the schools. They tutor four to six hours a week for the entire school year. um, And they, too, are supported with literacy coaches. Um, um, The coaches provide um, fidelity observations. Um, They go through the student assessment data. They also talk about planning and reflection. They, they um, go through the tutoring sessions with the tutors, have them reflect on how the students did, um, where the students need to go. Um, and then there's a lot of professional learning because we do not ask that the volunteers have any kind of education background. Um, so we provide a lot of training and theory on um, literacy, um, foundational skills, um, and, and how to best support students, not just with their academic skills, but also with the social-emotional learning, um, some mindfulness strategies, and all of the ways to support the students. You mentioned phonetics, and I think that's a, a system that a lot of people have learned to read. And without kind of snubbing or looking down on new technologies and new theories, are there tried and true practices that Read to Succeed kind of focuses on because of the fact that, you know, this has worked for so long? Yes. um, So many years ago, the National Reading Panel was formed, um, and they really came out 
um, after studying thousands of research studies, really found that students in elementary years really need to focus on five literacy components um, and able to be able to learn to read. I would like to ask, when you're working with children as early as six weeks, I mean, these are brand new babies. What are the kinds of things that you're encouraging parents to do, family members, when they are around a child that obviously is learning no matter what? Absolutely. Um, but what are the kinds of things that they could do that will kind of boost that perhaps better understanding of where they're going to actually be when it, it, it comes to reading and literacy? Absolutely. Um, reading and literacy really starts at birth, even before birth. Um, And with especially those young ones, those infants and those newborns, really the importance of talking, giving them so many, um, so many words and so many languages, um, giving them a a vast um, pool of words, which to draw from and continuing that not just from infancy, um, continuing to give children words um, that, that you might think are too difficult, that might be too hard, you know, hard for them to understand, um, but giving them the, this um, rich vocabulary. Studies have shown all different sorts of numbers, um, but some research has shown that students need to hear words over 28 times in order to really learn that word. Um, So really the repetition, um, hearing words over and over again in different contexts, giving them meaning, um, giving them background knowledge. Um, I think that's also really important with the infants is giving them all of those different experiences um, that they can learn and draw from. Um, which really sets such an important foundation um, for um, for as, as they grow up and start to learn in school. As you're promoting literacy and words and these, you know, the vocabulary and the reading techniques, how hard is it to kind of combat the desire to pick up an electronic device, whether it's TV, tablet, whatever it may be, and that just is so much more entertaining at these formative ages it's got to be a tough battle. It, it is. It is. It's it's a tough battle for me sometimes, you know, when I have a book, um, but there's also a show that I want to watch. Um, so I think that it's, you know, encouraging a balance um, that if you are going to provide children with some screen time, um, make sure that it's still engaging. You ask some questions during or after the show about what they were watching. Um, engage in some back and forth conversations about it rather than just turning the TV off and saying, did you like that? And and really accepting a one word response. Um, And then I think um, there's also the importance of making sure that reading is not seen as as a punishment. Oh, you have to turn the screen off, um, you you know, turn the screens off and now go, you know, sit with a book. Um, Reading can definitely be used during quiet time, but it shouldn't be seen um, as a punishment. You know, you can't play with your toys. You can just read a book. Um, Reading should be seen um, as something that that students, uh, that children can get pleasure out of, Um, you know, whether it's just flipping through the pages and looking at the pictures or reading and being or being read to. Is there something to be said about a child who is at this formative age that is can identify words, but maybe not understand the full context of what's going on, but making up their own stories as they go along? Absolutely. Absolutely. We talk about reading and the importance of um, getting a, having children have a favorite book and wanting to hear it over and over and over again. Um, and every time they read the book, just like as adults, um, if we re if we read a book um, or reread a book or even rewatch a TV show, um, every time we um, read or watch, we're getting something new or something different out of it. Um, so every time we we reread, it's an opportunity um, for something else. Um, maybe they pick up on a subtlety that they didn't read before. Um, and I think it's all just very important stages in children learning to read and connecting um, the pictures to the words, the words um, that have meaning. Um, 
every time the student is read to, they comprehend it a little bit more. Um, their confidence grows because they can anticipate what comes next and there's that predictability. Um, they have that background knowledge um, from hearing the story before, so they feel a little bit more confident when asking or answering questions. I love the idea of the favorite book because I, my daughter has them, I'm sure, all the kids who love to read or are learning to read also will pick up on that sort of thing. And everybody usually has a favorite book, just like they have a favorite movie. How important is it to also establish that ownership of, you know, this is my book. This is the kind of thing that I like. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I know with um, with the book vending machines um, in our program, our, um, the tutoring program, students are reading um, a reading A to Z book um, with their tutor for a number of sessions. Once they finish the book, they read the book in its entirety, um, and then they're able to take that book home um, and have it part of their at-home library. Um, and many of our tutors ask, you know, when you take this book home, who are you going to read it to? Um, and I think that's such an important question. Read it to your mom, read it to your sister, read it to your cat or your dog or your stuffed animal, but um, really engage in it. And I think that there's that um, that, that ch importance of a child feeling proud of having um, that ownership of something. This is something that I've worked on. I might have struggled at it with the begin at the beginning, um, but now I own this. I love that you bring up um, animals because that is becoming very popular in schools where they might have a service dog or a dog that just comes in and you can read to it. I, I like to think that the theory behind that is, is there's no adult who is going to interrupt or correct. There has to be something said for that to really let the child explore. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let, you know, allow a child to create their own story around the pictures. Allow the child to um, come up with their, you know, make your own adventure, come up with their own ending for a story. Um, all of those different things are, are so important in um, it, not just with their reading skills, but also with comprehension, um, coming up with alternative endings, um, you know, what makes sense, what can also, you know, um, what can also make sense, really tap into their critical thinking skills. I'm well. guilty of that too. I, <laughs> I read so many books and I always have that part of me that says, I could have made that ending better, right? We, we could <laughs> right. still do that Absolutely. into adulthood. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about electronic devices being such a prevalent thing now in society. What other issues uh, are facing this problem of illiteracy that we have that are causing these issues? I think... Um, I think, yes, technology is definitely one of them. Um, you know, we see that conversations, um, the, the importance of, of uh, oral language and conversations, um, and, and you can measure the number of words heard, um, and research has looked into the number of words heard at, a, at different ages. Some of it can be um, attributed to technology um, and that replacing some back and forth exchanges, um, different work schedules um, of parents and of caregivers that might also lead um, to some challenges. Um, and really valuing um, experiences and language and having um, having that important, the, the important, really stressing the importance of homeschool connect. Um, I know homework was also, uh, was always um, very valued in my, in my house. Um, is your homework done? What do you have to do? Did you get it all done? And really making sure that piece is, is followed up on. I know um, kindergartners are getting homework now. Um, I know it's a big task, but there, there's so much importance of um, really a, a seamless homeschool connection and making sure that um, learning is valued. I know that uh, Buffalo Public School Superintendent Dr. Tanja Williams has often talked about the inequities of, of city kids. And, you know, a lot of these underprivileged kids, up to 90%, I know she's been quoted as saying, are, are falling into this category. What does Read to Succeed Buffalo do to help those kids who, you know, are, are struggling socioeconomically outside of the socio-emotional learning that they're also going through? So AARP Foundation Experience Corps um, pairs students in pre-K through third grade with a volunteer tutor. 
Um, we are currently in 10 schools throughout Buffalo. Um, and the, tutor, the student gets a tutor, um, the same tutor for the entire school year um, from October, roughly October through June. Um, and they work on either pre-literacy skills or on reading accuracy and fluency. Um, reading so it sounds like you're talking, reading smoothly. Um, and we've seen tremendous benefits, as you said, um, not just with the literacy component, but also that social emotional piece. So these students in underprivileged schools um, receive a, a reading literacy tutor that comes in twice a week just to see them. Um, we always have tutors ask, well, do the students feel like they're being singled out um, when they're being um, asked to come to tutoring, um, which is not the case. All of the other students in the classroom always want to know what's going on. They always want to come for tutoring. Um, and this is an opportunity for the children to see, receive 30 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time. Um, we're not saying that the teachers can't do that. It's just, it's such a struggle with all of the other things that they have to do um, within a school day. So we provide that twice a week um, for students. Um, we've seen tremendous growth, particularly in accuracy, um, reading the words as they're written on the page. Um, students last year, we had a 76% 76 76 of students um, reached the benchmark or above on the school assessment by the end of the year. So the students have really showed that they're able to read really accurately and they're able to get um, and feel that success. I'm glad you brought that up. I wanted to follow up with what you're doing here and what is actually you know, what kids are going through this learning process. We hate to rely on tests, but sometimes we have to to make these proper assessments. Are you you are seeing just strives towards better test scores in the schools because sooner or later, I know that they're still in third grade. They're going to be taking these state assessments whether they want to or not. Absolutely. I didn't want to either, but <laughs> hey, I had to do it. So now they have to go through it. Feel my pain, children. <laughs> Absolutely. I think I think it's one thing to say, um, you know, I think the, a, a term that it's almost being mis, um, overused or misused is um, using data to inform instruction. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. always want to do that. Um, but Read to Succeed Buffalo, I think, it does it very well, um, and we practice what we preach. Um, if we have data from all the way from the number of sessions to the minutes of sessions to the time on task, all the way up to the words read per minute, we really want to take and look at that, those numbers um, and really see what we need to change. If the students are not reading accurately, should they um, be doing more echo reading in their sessions? Um, should they be doing more choral reading where they, where the student and the tutor are reading together in unison at the same time um, to increase um, their words per minute or, or their reading skills? Um, but really taking a look, really pausing um, to look and, and um, see all that data and making sure that um, the data changes our practice. And outside of, say, getting a, a, a decent test score, there has to be a level of personal satisfaction that kind of fuels all of this to want to continue to improve and, and even make reading that much more fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the students, sometimes the students, especially by second and third grade, they know they're not the strongest readers in the class. Um, so we really want to build up their confidence. Um, and at the beginning of the year, that might mean um, reading a book um, that is just below, that's just um, below their their reading, their grade level. So they they have, they can master the words in that book and they can feel confident and successful with it and then build on that success. Um, a lot of it is also student choice. Um, and we've seen that with um, the science of reading data is showing um, students when more, in, um, are more engaged with text that they pick out. Um, and really finding books um, that mean a lot to them. And I know from personal experience um, th that required reading in college wasn't always the most interesting <laughs> for me. And I know that I can definitely read a book. Um, I'm much more interested in being engaged. I might have more to say about a book that I get to pick 
um, rather than having a book um, given or selected for me. Is there a healthy balance with that where we can say, you know, throw out a challenge, rise to the occasion? It might seem scary to a student and it might be difficult to read a subject that they're not terribly interested in, but does that have any benefit as well? Absolutely. I think that it's, uh, I think that students, if you give them a challenge, they, they, they want to rise to the occasion. Absolutely. Um, so I think that, um, creating something like that, um, creating challenges, um, let's see how you do on this. Um, you know, last time, um, you read a book with, um, you know, 200 words. Let's try reading that. This book has 250 words. Let's try, let's try reading this and see if you can do just as well. Up until and even after they might go through, the, you know, the Read to Succeed program, what are the kinds of things that parents and families can do to extend those things? Are there book clubs or what other kinds of things are kids encouraged to be involved with to keep that joy or at least the interest in reading going? I think um, some of the things that we were talking about, um, really building that background knowledge. So giving children different experiences. And this is not just... Um, taking them to the museum, um, but going in, uh, to different places, um, going to local parks, um, going for um, rides in the car and exposing them to different places, um, definitely reading with students and giving them those different experiences. Um, and then I think pro pro providing them with new and novel vocabulary, I think is just such an important piece. Um, we talk about... Um, you know, the challenges with reading, if students are able to sound out words, but they don't know what those words mean, um, you know, they're, they're basically just word callers. And there, there isn't that comprehension piece. That's really the goal of reading. Um, so really providing students with, a, with new words and a lot of words. Um, and I think um, reading is really the key to that. Um, they, they've done lots of studies on the um, importance of vocabulary in children's books and how children's books really contain you know, just about 50% uh, more rare words um, than adult primetime TV, um, conversations between two college-educated adults. Um, mm. And those are words that children are not necessarily going to see or hear on TV. I was just reading a children's book yesterday, and the character rubbed his bleary eyes and padded out of bed um, and hustled around the room rather than, you know, waking up, rubbing his tired eyes and walking across the room. Um, I think that vocabulary really creates such a better mental picture, or such, such vivid imagery, but also exposes children to that rich language as well. We've heard oftentimes that, you know, to be into social studies, to be into mathematics and to perform well, or, you know, again, just have that interest, you know, reading is going to be a component of that no matter what you do. You can't really say that about a lot of other subjects. And there are some people who compartmentalize and say, well, when am I going to use trigonometry? Or when am I going to use, you know, knowing all the capitals of whatever countries <laughs> are out there? Do kids at that early age that you're working at understand that this is really a foundation that opens the door for success in all those other subject areas? I think so. I, I hope that we pr promote that with our students as well as um, if you, you know, we want you to become, the, you know, the next mayor of Buffalo or the next um, county executive, the next president of the United States. And to be able to do that, we need to create this, this strong foundation. Um, I know math is so important. All of, all, of the other all of the other subjects are so important, but that exactly is why literacy is so important to me. Um, because it is, um, without that reading, um, without that understanding of language, yes, once they get to fourth grade, they're really going to struggle with that content knowledge. Um, but even in the early grades, um, they're not going to be able, they're, they're going to struggle with um, word problems in math um, and those skills um, that just all come back to reading. How important is it to have role models promoting literacy. And I'm not just talking about, you know, NBA stars or, you know, that this person plays for the Buffalo Bills, which is wonderful and great. Absolutely. And I like the fact that you have the AARP program because these kids also see folks from everyday walks of life, but still providing something to look up to, to see, hey, this is how important reading was to me 
therefore, this is how it applies to you as, as, a, as a young person growing up. Yes, absolutely. I think that that's so important. I think it's part of the reason why there are so many celebrities with their own reading clubs and book groups, right? Um, I think it's it's always been incredibly important to me um, in my family to see both of my parents reading um, and the importance of it. Even in a busy household, even in a busy family um, where you're not able to read for enjoyment all of the time, just again, stressing that reading shouldn't be a chore, um, pointing out um, different print in the environment, um, seeing, uh, you know, really valuing the importance of reading. Um, you know, if you're putting something together, um, if you're following instructions, following a recipe, really talking through the steps of that so the children really see the importance of, oh, the, the reading unlocks um, make a, the making a recipe, reading unlocks, um, for, you know, creating, um, creating a skill. And I think that applies to all subject matters, whether you're going down academia or what's becoming a little bit more popular now that it's went away for a little while, but you know, the uh, career and technical instruction where, you know, the Lexile levels on some of those textbooks are off the charts but again, Absolutely. you have to have those fundamentals before you can start opening up the hood of a car and poking around. You need to know what you're doing, yes. and you're going to get that from books. Right. Absolutely. And really valuing, valuing again, there, is, there are so many different... We need all of those different skills to make the world work. Um, but there are some things that... Um, there are some, the, again, going back to those foundational skills that are so important... Um, if you would give, if you give me those textbooks, I'm not going to. I, I might be able to sound some of those words out, um, but without the background knowledge and the vocabulary, I'm not going to be able to make sense of it. Um, so, really, again, the importance of all of those, those things coming together. So here we are in 2024. Read to Succeed Buffalo has been here for, you know, God, look at how many years you're still around. 17 years later, still here and and doing great. What is new for 2024? Do you have anything that's coming up that people should know about? We're actually piloting a new program. Um, so we're looking to recruit um, tutors of all ages, not just 50 and older, um, and looking at um, foundational reading skills and work going into um, schools, um, K through third grade, um, and working on decoding skills, on, um, on, on basic reading skills with students. Um, so we'll be recruiting um, for both programs this fall. Um, so if you are 50 and older, you can look into our Experience Corps program. Um, if not, um, but you are interested in tutoring, um, we have, we'll be piloting our Intensive Tutoring Corps, or ITC, um, this school year that we're very excited about. And I would assume as a 501c a uh, nonprofit organization, you also must have a lot of efforts going into fundraising to keep the program going on. If you'd yes. like to talk a little bit about how people can help and what's going on there, that'd be great. Absolutely. Um, as, if, as a nonprofit, we are always accepting donations. Um, we're also um, always looking um, for book donations. Um, we get the books, um, new or gently used books, right into the hands of students um, in our care child care, our care preschool, our experience core. Um, again, the, the importance of that ownership. Um, we distribute books. Um, we let the students decide, the, let the students choose books that they can take home. Um, and, and to have and join their, um, their at-home libraries. Um, so those are um, ways to get involved. Um, if you're not able to financially donate, we'd, we donate, we'd love to have you as a volunteer tutor. And there is still some funding that's coming down statewide. I know Governor Hochul here in New York made some pronouncements earlier in the year. Can you talk a little bit about how that's going to impact what you're doing at Read to Succeed Buffalo? So uh, I think the governor's um, the governor's really talking about getting back to basics um, in her plan, um, making sure that teachers are at, receive um, the best education, um, and really looking um, getting back to the science of reading, um, really ensuring. Um, that what's happening in the classroom is research based, and that it's not just um, doing what we've always uh, 
doing what we've always done, um, doing what, and getting what we've always gotten, making sure um, that everything, yeah, everything goes back to research, everything goes back to data. Um, I can say we've definitely made some changes, um, but following research and following data has always been extremely important to us. And budgets are always going to fluctuate and we're always going to have that. And without getting political, it's got to be a sense of satisfaction knowing that, well, a school might be going through some tough times. These resources are still available to them. Absolutely. These are topics that are very important um, to folks, making sure um, that their money is invested wisely um, and that they can see the data. We have program reports every year that we show our funders um, that speak to the progress of the students. Um, the satisfaction of the tutors, as well as the satisfaction of the classroom teachers. So what changes do they see in the students' confidence? Um, How are they seeing the students learn and grow? Um, And they've had tremendous feedback for us as well. Awesome. And how can people find out more information, websites, social media? If you'd love to share that, that'd be yeah, great. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, our, our website is read to succeed buffaloorg um, or you can call the office at 716-843-8895, um, or you can find us on Facebook. Awesome. Julia Bruckle, it has been wonderful having you here. Thanks so much Thank for joining you. us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And that'll wrap up this episode of The Reading Revolution, powered by bookvending.com. We've got much more coming down the pipeline, so we hope you'll join us for our future episodes. And again, if you have a suggestion of what you would like to hear on The Reading Revolution, email readingrevolutionpod at gmail.com. I'm your host, Josh Gregory. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.